Hello and welcome back to Darren and Doing. I'm Will Hester and I'm joined by the brilliant Ben Bowman. Ben, how was your weekend, mate? Uh, well, it started off okay. Um, I went suit shopping for a best mate's wedding on uh, Saturday, of which I'm a best man, actually. He's got three best men. A bit greedy for asking. Oh, yeah. To be honest, but I'm one <laughs> of them. And uh, so we went shopping. It was mission failed. We'll get him next time. Got a little bit of grief from the fiance about it. You know, weddings in six months. Can't doubt it. We'll be, we'll be fine. Get him. Don't worry. So he, yeah. what we, what we decided to do was instead, he's taken all our sizes and he's just going to order all a load of different ones online. And we're going to go around his house. I think a couple of Saturdays time and try them on. So he just put a message in our group chat just now, saying, "Um, he's this. This is what my mate's like. He's basically made a spreadsheet." Of like all of our sizes, right? I don't know <laughs> if anyone's got a mate like that in the group chat. It's just like super organized. Um, so he's made a spreadsheet of all our sizes. And then he followed it up with a message saying, on I don't know what website he's looking at. Basically, one of the shops we went in was um Hawks and Curtis on Saturday in Westfield, London, if anybody knows that. It's uh, do you remember when Gary Neville did that suit range? <laughs> yeah, remember yeah. That? last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were looking at the trying to find the Gary Neville range in the shop. He's just made it even better and just said, no joke, one of the suits I'm getting to, for us to try on is the official Harry Maguire wedding suit. It's called HM5. What? <laughs> Harry Maguire wedding suit, apparently. I don't know whether it's... Wait, some... they fucking named it after him? Yeah, Harry Maguire wedding suit. <laughs> Wait, from... the one he actually wore to his wedding? I don't know. It's from, it's from Mark Darcy. Uh, it's quite nice, to be fair. I'm just looking what? at it now. H- HM5 stone tailored two piece suit. Um, and exclusive to Mark Darcy, Manchester United and England footballer Harry Maguire's wedding suit. If you're looking for a summer suit that will be versatile, consider adding this men's two piece <laughs> suit to your inventory. Versatile. The fabric is made from soft and comfortable poly viscose cloth, which has been enhanced with lycra for added stretch and flexibility. So I might be rocking up to my best mate's wedding Please. in Harry Maguire's wedding suit. Please tell me you fucking wearing a Harry Maguire's wedding suit. That's insane. Because you must be the only person that would be able to like f- fit in Harry Maguire's suit. Are you yeah. not the same height as him? Probably. I don't, how, Probably how, taller, how tall you know, he's like six foot five, is he? Oh, I mean, six I'm not that tall. That is nuts, mate. Yeah, Harry Maguire's wedding suit. Uh, he's 1.94 meters, which is... What is that? He, he's big. Foot, basically the same height. No way. Taller, that is yeah. so good. Yeah, how's he getting paid for it? I know. I know. I was, I, he's put it in the group chat just now. I was like, no way. And it's the actually, it's actually the suit. The that name's he wore. Maguire, Harry Maguire. Yeah. <laughs> the name's Harry Maguire. I am. Um, that's yeah. insane. That is so good. That's the quality, mate. You got yeah. the content you're going to drop on TikTok when you're rocking up fucking Harry Maguire suit. It's going to be yeah. sensational. Harry <laughs> Maguire. Yeah. Drinks the vodka, <laughs> drinks the Jaeger. The suit's That's fucking so massive. Good. That's ridiculous, man. That's so sick. I know. I, I was um, a Mo Salah go away from go hiding. It was the worst weekend ever until Mo Salah put buried down at the bottom. Oh, corner yeah, and I was yeah, like, well, yeah. we're leaving here with something. We're leaving here with something. Actually, yeah. Johnny Cardoso, yeah, was he good, had man. a fucking blinder. I, I'm trying to think of any other positives. Nothing. I don't think there's any other. I don't. I genuinely don't think there was any positives from the week. I had a nice roast dinner. Nice. Well, what had my have? first roast dinner of the year. Actually, oh my god. Of the year. I went there. And... You've not yeah. had one in this calendar year. Oh no, I, I had no. But like going out to the pub. Oh right, okay. Like, yeah, like yeah. I've had a roast dinner. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But like the uh, this was like called the trio, and it had it was um all of them, and. Oh, well, it's all of them more like turkey, uh, uh, pork, gammon, turkey. It, yeah, no, nah, yeah. So it was turkey. Uh, so maybe not all of them, but it was it was pork, uh, beef, and turkey. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. And and it was straight after the Spurs game, so like I was emotional. I yeah. just needed to just fucking. I needed it. I needed it. Yeah, um, I and it was like a date night. Me and my girlfriend. Like... Um, and she was just asking me why I was just like not speaking to her, but I was just like, like just absolutely devouring yeah. this fucking roast dinner and, just, and then i just yeah. finished paid the bill and then walked, walked out left her there yeah i was so pissed off i was so annoyed i needed it it was nice that was like the one positive yeah nice. um, from the weekend but ben mate what was that fucking game i can't tell you do you want to talk about it should we end the podcast no i think we should end it now 
Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, all the best. It was fucking shit. It was uh, like, I, I, I know that's not a, like an articulate way of describing the game, but is there another way of actually describing that game apart from just wank? Yeah, it was absolutely wank. It was not even a good wank. It was just a big shitty wank. It, yeah. it was wank. Shit wank. Shit wank. <laughs> what a load of shit wank. That was a mindy wank. Yeah. This is how I feel when you ask me if I want to talk about it. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> what, can you, like, explain? Like, was th- was that loss on the players? Or was it a tactical issue? Or a bit uh, of both? Both, I think. Like, I, w- I think I was quite defensive of Ange after the Brighton game about, like, um, I think the players just completely shit the bed and after that, what was a quality first half performance. I think it was both this weekend. Definitely both. Yeah. Um, I thought I didn't really understand his... Uh, I didn't really understand the substitutions. Um, the timing... They were weird. Bit, weren't they? Weird. I didn't really understand really weird. this kind of almost acceptance to just kind of watch the game go by a little bit as well at points. of. I mean, I, maybe, well, that's, maybe that's harsh because he was obviously yeah, proactive with his subs but um, or reactive, I say, but then it, oh, I don't know. They were FIFA career mode subs, mate. You know when you're getting absolutely yeah. dicked up by the AI or FIFA too. career mode, you just put like loads of strikers on the pitch and hope something happens. Yeah, it was that. Like, there was no like yeah plan. Put, I don't think two strikers on the pitch and then take off the best creative players to try and feed those strikers. We were ending up in situations where it was like Basuma crossing the ball in from deep and trying to stick it on the Solanke. Like I think Solanke was the only kind of outfield player that could sort of walk away with his head held high from that game. I thought because. The amount yeah. of work that first half, I thought again, his link up play and stuff was great. Um, getting into the box, winning corners, all this kind of stuff. But there was so much kind of creative onus put on him in that second half because we'd taken Madison off, we'd taken Kudu off. Um, I mean, Kudu was having a terrible game, to be fair. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's something we actually spoke about before, didn't we? About like tight pitches. Yeah, you actually did. Not weirdly, it. though. Did you see you that tweet it. that was going around about like um, Spurs' record on small pitches? What that's an actual thing. Yeah, someone sent it. Someone did it. Put it out on Twitter earlier. Oh, yesterday I think it was. Someone. I, I'll try and find it. But because um, can I? Sorry, yeah. uh, you, you carry on. Because no, no, uh, because well, the the whilst trying to find that, I did think not only was it a small, very congested pitch. Palace did fair play to Palace because they did everything in their will, with like internal sort of decisions before the game to disrupt the way we play and disrupt all momentum of us growing into a game. Yeah. They, obviously, I think they, 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 I think there was a lot of hype with Spurs going into the game. Obviously, Palace haven't won a game all season. Mikey Moore was starting a lot of it. And, and they killed that minute one. Killed, fucking George. <laughs> <goal. laughs> no, they, they killed that minute one by... <laughs> but they killed it minute, minute one because, first of all, they fucking absolutely waterlogged the pitch. I don't know what was going on. You yeah. you posted it on... I'd noticed it and then I saw you post it on Twitter. My mate like your was, mate at the game said that yeah, they he was texting me. drenched like, it before. For 10, for 10 minutes, um, for 10 minutes before, they just absolutely soaked the pitch. And then at half time as well, yeah. They only soaked um, on like our the year to end. We were really, well. yeah. I actually rate that. I rate I that well. because that, that, that's live with that sort I, of shit. I, is I, what it is. Yeah, no, of course you have. Yeah, and and they their press was amazing. And obviously, of course, there's problems linked to the goal, but the they did everything in their power to just disrupt us. They yeah, they walled off the pit pitch the first first minute that we were trying to spray it about, and the water was just slowing the, the ball down. You could see the water absolutely spinning off the football as it was rolling towards, and the players couldn't do. We couldn't we couldn't sort of settle in the game. They were so physical. They were disrupting it with foul, foul, tactical foul. Will Hughes is like the best midfielder. Him and Ryan Yates, they're both yeah. dickheads, but they're like the best midfielders in the league at just being dickheads like and, and disrupting a game and disrupting a rhythm. And we couldn't adjust to the rhythm. And and they kept the ball in the air. They, kept, they, they were time-wasting, people going down. It just completely killed all momentum. But in a way, you've got to have a response to that. You, 100%. And... and and we're going to talk about um, we we got a question coming up about our away form, but there is a problem there with the away form. I just thought like we need we've, there's got to be ways we go about it that we understand the game state because we don't, and we make sure that we never we we 
we want to be proactive, not reactive. And I think a lot of the time we're reactive, but we're too slow to react to, to things that are happening in the game that we maybe haven't expected or whatever it is. And then and then by then it's too late or they, they've grown into the game. We've got to kill those that momentum. Because I think when we arrived, I think Sellers Park was sniffing their first win of the season. Yeah, 100%. It was like instant. And, and you knew, as a Spurs fan, we've seen this film so many times before, what was going to happen. Um, yeah. But what were you saying about the smaller pitch? Yeah, I, found, I just found it, actually. Um, our away losses in 2024 correlate into pitch size, right? So Pallet, Sellers Park's not a full-size pitch. The Amex is, St. James's is, Anfield's not, Stamford Bridge is not, and Craven Cottage is the smallest, 100 metres times 65. This is not an excuse, but both our away, best away performances in 2024 have been on <laughs> full-size pitches, uh, Villa Park and Old Trafford. Um it seems like an absolute shit excuse. But I'd, I'd thought about it before the game with the way that we've been setting up and way we've been playing. About like Kulu and players like that. Just, I don't know. Watching a game of football away at Sellers Park at two o'clock on a Sunday might be one of the worst football watching experiences because you've got that low sun. They've just fucking soaked the pitch. They're pressing us hard. It's that shit low camera angle. It was just a yeah, horrible like so viewing horrible. experience. Like, yeah. Um, it was horrible, mate. But we were we were terrible, absolutely terrible. And like you said, we you know we have to adapt better in games to notice that because it's like when they were winning the ball back off us, it wasn't even they were necessarily winning us the ball back high up the pitch all the time because the, but because they were pressing high, they were forcing us into errors, and we were giving the ball back to them. I think we lost the ball forty seven times in our own danger zone, so like our own defensive Fucking third. Hell. And there was a stat that how many of them led to a shot. I've got it up here. I used it for the vid yesterday. Um, yeah. Where is it? Two seconds, sorry. So, yeah, we, we lost the ball 49 times in our own danger zone with seven of those leading to a shot compared to Palace, who lost it 16 times and didn't lead to a single shot. Bear in mind, our pressing has been obviously super effective. They don't. They didn't really yeah. allow us to kind of do that to them, and they were they were excellent at winning the ball back. Not in the first phase necessarily, but the second phase a lot of the time, where they would let yeah. us play. We'd maybe break that first initial press, and then Hughes or Lerma or whoever would win it back in that second phase, or Wharton, and then we'd be exposed. Um, but you know, they, if they were comfortable to win that ball back in that second phase, kind of in between the halfway line and 25, 30 yards from goal. You've got a striker there in Dominic Solanke who can use an outlet if they're that happy to come onto you and press up the pitch and play off him and then go because they're going to commit men. We've already seen that they're going to yeah. commit men. It was just bizarre. And then the first chance we get in the second half, two minutes in, we create our best goal scoring opportunity probably the entire game with Kulazewski. He probably should have scored. All from, again, we didn't take a goal kick long because we haven't done that at all all season. And this is where I do question Postacoglu in this kind of commitment to playing out from the back at every single opportunity and the, the wantingness to get on with the game so quickly every single time. We play the ball short to Romero and Romero chips it into Solanke. He wins that first battle. Madison wins the second one and then Solanke plays it and we're away. We're in. Like it's, you've got, you've got a striker there who, you know, Solanke isn't a target man really in terms of the way that he's being used at Spurs. But this is about having a plan B and being able to adapt in games and use him like that because yeah. it works. Yeah. I just don't understand it. Yeah. I really don't. I did not understand I, that. I made the point, um, Last last week with West Ham, obviously, what's our plan B? And then it's it's actually personnel. But that was an actual example of sometimes you need a tactical plan B, Absolutely, not just yeah. personnel. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you need to read, like read the room, understand that the the consequences if 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 there's a continuation of of how you're playing or how you started, and and adjust and and see what they're doing and, and react and not be so slow in that reaction. But um. Can I just say I've seen a lot of things and and I can't remember where where it was. Can't remember what it. Oh yeah. So there's a there's a um there's a question from uh Taff Forever hashtag cause. He says why does Spurs Twitter overreact to the slightest mistakes we make? We win trophies this season. We lose and out. Where does this massive delusion of our of grandeur come from? Gen genuinely interested. Twitter is toxic as uh, toxic as it is, but one result and we are ruined. Don't get it. Can I say, I feel like Spurs fans at the moment, we're in two categories. You're either, we win and you're not, you can't, you're not satisfied because you're looking at the next game thinking we'll probably get dicked. So what's the point in even yeah. being excited? Or, and I think we might fall in this category. Every time we win, we take it like 
that the last game we could ever play. Do you know what I mean? And and the, <laughs> the, we want to we want to buy into it, and we're so we're over the moon. We're so excited about the positives because we see the minerals there, and you're looking forward to the next game already because you're thinking, okay, let's let's kick on now. Let's kick on. And I feel like there's two places to be. I feel like there's not many people in the middle. I think you're either like you every win you're delighted because it's exactly how you know we can play. Yeah, exactly. But there's but some some fan base we we win like that and they think okay but it's frustrating because we know we can play like that way but we what we've seen so far is that we're not consistent enough doing it so what's the point in even being happy with that the way we play i want to see it for a long period of time so yeah. i get both sides i'm in the second category of uh, every time we win i'm I, 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 I know i'm being deluded uh, deluded when i'm starting talking about trophies and stuff but but i want to be a football fan that enjoys every win and, and wants to be optimistic there's no, you feel shit when your outlet when your passion and you, you can't be optimistic about it it actually ruins your day-to-day -day life because yeah. you're so invested in this club yeah um did you sorry i just on that did you listen to did you listen to the fighting cock yesterday uh i've listened to the first 20 minutes i think the the first that, minutes, yeah. well, that was what i was going to say like that first yeah, yeah, yeah. 10, 15 so minutes good, of just like yeah 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 that yeah anyone that's not listened to it it was vintage tfc it's so good that. yeah it did make me feel a lot better but uh, yeah I, I just think uh, i don't where, where's this first of all what do you think of that but also can we transfer the game yesterday in the context of let's say th that week that west Ham win and the game yesterday can we sort of trans transfer that into the broader view from the start of the season we've had. Because what's the primary reason we've dropped so many points, do you think, this season? <sighs> lack of leadership. Lack of leadership, lack of ability to adapt according to game state, I think, uh, which comes from the manager and the players. Um, just quite, we're just soft. Like, we're just soft as shit. Like, still have that about us where we've got this kind of soft underbelly um that takes time to to you know to get rid of and you know as you win more games and you become more solid naturally because of that you your kind of desire to commit to defending everything goes through the roof look at arsenal again that's kind of tactical instructions as well to be fair and they've completely changed the way that they play obviously but um in terms of what you were saying you're right and i think both sides of the party are guilty of kind of maybe going over the top in certain instances but i think you get vilified either what side, what other side of the fence you sit on. Do you know what I mean? Whether it's like you are super positive or super negative after even a win, but then it's just like it makes it mental that people would be on that side of the fence after a win. Do you know what I mean? In terms of like just being super negative and super kind of just like, yeah, well, we're going to lose the next one. You know, we've had years of shit football. And th the problem is with Tottenham, and that, this is the biggest problem that we need to solve is that why when we're when we're good we're so good and why when we're shit we're so bad there's no in between i think that's kind of like also yeah. like borne out in terms yeah. of the results <laughs> no we don't draw many games do we we kind of either win or lose um and i think a lot of the time it's not even down to defensive solidity which certainly hasn't been this season look we were terrible at the back the other day but we were kind of causing a lot of our own problems it wasn't or it wasn't that we were necessarily getting opened up all the time, although was, there was moments in that second half where we were ridiculously open, but it's because we were really putting our foot down and trying to win the game. Um, but I think that's something that's maybe changed compared to last season. But I don't know, like you should be able to enjoy victories. And I think the problem is, is that the other side of the camp who was super negative about everything almost acts like people ignore the negatives when we lose because they've, they've got it so wrapped up in their own head that people who really enjoy things when we win are deluded. So that when we lose, they think that people are making excuses and people are people won't criticize the manager or criticize the players. It's just part of the process and we'll get there. And that's not true. Like people, you you're allowed to be both. You're allowed to be negative yeah. about a certain performance or certain players' performances, but still kind of have this thing of like we'll, we'll get there. Well, we'll get there. Like that's how I feel. Like I was I felt super, super flat on Sunday. I didn't want to do my video on one day. I didn't want to do the pod. I didn't want to talk about Spurs. I didn't want to make any TikTok videos. I didn't want to do anything because it was just like, that was fucking shit. Like, that was really bad. And, like, I don't want to talk about it, like, because I don't know if there's anything new to address, you know, but you do it because, you you know, you, it's therapy, right? But I think there's this perception from people who sit on that more whingy, negative, moany side that it's like nobody sees it in that way. It's either just like people are just like, no, 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 it's going to be fine. We lost the Palace, but it's going to be fine, like, all the time. It's not that's not true. 
Mm-hmm. But it's healthy to kind of have a bit of balance. I think that's kind of where we sort of both sit. Like Sunday was the most frustrated I've probably been with Ange. Certainly most frustrated I've been with the group. But then again, we go back to last weekend and it's like, and it was great in terms of the in-game substitutions. Sometimes it's just not going to work for you and you have to expect yeah. that inconsistency with a young group. It's just about being realistic and kind of seeing the bigger picture sometimes. But I get why sometimes with Spurs, because of all the other frustrations, that gets lost. And that's part of the reason why tomorrow feels so big as well, because it's a cup game and we've we've starved of cup success, you know, and we've got injuries tomorrow. And that's just added to the shit feeling around it. And the fact that we're playing Man City, even though Pep said he's going to play all the fucking kids, it feels much bigger than it should be because of all the frustrations about the club that Ange can't control about that trophy drought, something that he's trying to change. And that's why it's not fair on him necessarily. Like if we lose tomorrow, like that, I don't know that 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 growing sentiment. Or I say growing sentiment. Like, is it growing? We've won eight out of the last ten, or seven out of the last nine, or whatever. It's kind of going into this game. I was going to say like growing sentiment of people wanting him to leave. You know, he can't control that trophy drought. He well, he can by trying yeah, to win no, it. Exactly. But you know, we've got injuries, all these kind of stuff, and it's not excuses. And look, we uh, tomorrow is massive, and I think it's a must-win game for Spurs, even though it's against City. But I don't know. It's just really. It's just. Uh, just shit in it. <laughs> I, I think I think the frustration is is like what were you eleven games into the Premier League season? Was that ten or eleven games? I don't, I don't know. But no, like we've dropped so many points. League game that was. Yeah, we've dropped so many points, and I, and like we were saying, I get in the last podcast, the games in the Europa League are perfect because they're little dopamine hits in between the Premier League games. Yeah, if you take the Europa League out, out, out of context. I mean, we should be winning the games we we have won in the Europa League. That I th- I think we're in a bad place mentally as a as a as a fan base. The Europa League is our is our competition this season. That is what we need to now set our whole desire upon, and 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 keep trying to. Obviously, we're not writing the season off. No way. But the worry is, is that we know we're going to cons- we're we're going to drop points. Uh, so many times now in the course of the season, but it's, it's a frustra- frustration. I think in the Premier League, we've dropped so many points already, and it is it is infuriating because you're trying to look at progression. And now, there, if you take us in isolation as a club, there has been massive progression in yeah. the in the in, in within the last from this season to last season. I mean, you look at Kulusevski; he epitomizes that progression. He's exploded as a player. I mean, it's a, it's amazing to watch. We have we we have adjusted. We've tweaked. We've uh, we're now playing with two attacking eights. We're now playing, but uh, with a, with a um, target man up front. It, it, there is that progression, but you then look at a wider context and you're thinking, oh my god, I know there's progression there. But we have been eclipsed by at the moment. Obviously, a long way to go. We've been eclipsed by Villa. Chelsea, Liverpool looking better. The mm. competition around us has improved significantly. And you look at Brighton, how they've started the season. I know you're, you're expecting them to sort of fall off, but they don't have Europa League, for yeah. example. But, the, got, but those teams good, will yeah. also have their bumps. Like That's why yesterday yeah, was, course, or Sunday yeah. was so frustrating because Villa dropped points on Saturday at home to Bournemouth. Brighton chucked away a two-goal lead with four minutes to go against Wolves. Like, there was a Newcastle. real opportunity for us. Newcastle lost. It was a real opportunity yeah. for us to go and really put us up and look you know it depends what way you want to spin it right we might be four points above 16th but we're also four points off of fourth you know it's, it is i think yeah cool sure. right I so a lot of it, people drop points actually a lot of teams have dropped points this season yeah exactly so it, but then on the flip side of it you just have to look at yourself and what you can do and what you're what you should be doing better and there's a there's a lot of that with Spurs and Sunday is a huge game against Villa obviously we're not going to talk about that yeah, today. Ma- massive. yeah, yeah. but yeah it is yeah we will talk about it. Uh, I um, feel like that is the Premier League now, though, isn't it? Every game you look at it, you think, fucking hell, that's a massive game because everyone's dropping points left, right and centre. Everyone can beat anyone. You cannot drop by any percentage. And that's the frustration with, with, with Spurs at the moment. We're going into every game and we're, we don't know whether we're going to play well or we're going to be, be shit. But, yeah. And I feel like if you look at a lot of our performances... There's there's moments in the game where it could swing but either way that we might get lucky with a save or someone misses a shot and then yeah. we kick on from there or we get penalised and we get punished and and then and we can't churn out performance uh, performances of results when we're playing badly and that's the frustration and I, and I don't know where that comes from I don't know whether that comes from the manager or it comes from the leadership the players on the pitch we need to grab a game by the scruff of the neck but also it comes from as well the summer where we haven't signed game changers. 
we haven't signed the players that grab a game by the scruff of the neck when the when the going gets rough and 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 produce a moment of magic that rot that pick us up from the ground and 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 completely be that catalyst and momentum within games. We haven't we haven't gone out and got that. I know that's easier said than done, but mm. I just think there's there's so many things where it's just, it's just that frustration because you're looking at everyone around us. You're looking now at Villa and thinking, what a game. You're thinking about the Carabao Cup, thinking massive game. And it shouldn't be like that with 11 games into the season. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, we're going to have games like that. We're, we're going to have games like this. And like you said, I think that it makes Europe really important, doesn't it? Because like you said, there's going to be moments. The, the, the league is so competitive and we should be we should be in and around those top four places. But if we're not, then I think we've got to go and we've got to go and win that Europa League because then that kind of just puts the trophy thing to bed. It's a massive achievement. We get in the top four anyway. Easier said than done, of course. But I think our route to that, no one, the only, I think the only, <laughs> this might sound arrogant, but the only thing standing in our way of winning the Europa League is ourselves. If we play to, <laughs> if we play to the best of our ability, it's not like in the league where it's like you have to topple all these teams. You know, and our next away game is Galatasaray, and we've talked about our away form, and it's like that's a test. But you know, you win your home games and win the games you should win. Like we'll get through, and I have no doubts about the fact we're going to be in the knockout phase, and I have no doubts about the fact. Well, I think we can go deep in it, but I think the only thing that stands in our way when you look at the other the quality of the teams is is ourselves. When you look in the Premier League, you've got to get past. Look, I think one thing we learned from the weekend generally in the Premier League is that Man City, Arsenal, and Liverpool are so much stronger than everybody else. There's a, there's a level in there. And look, Chelsea will be able to go toe-to-toe yeah, with Liverpool on their sure. day, but Liverpool won the arm wrestle last weekend at Anfield, you know. Like, Chelsea are a good side. Spurs are a good side. Villa are a good side. that are well capable of getting points off of Arsenal, Liverpool and City. Definitely. We've done it. Like, we did it last season multiple times. Um, we beat Liverpool under oh, no, dodgy circumstances, of course. We beat Liverpool. We drew away at the Etihad. We drew away at the Emirates. Um, you know, we were in the game for the whole time against Man City at home. We were 3-0 down at half-time at home to Arsenal. But, you know, arguably, we d- maybe didn't deserve to lose that game on the balance of it. Like, things not going our way, mm. disallowed goal, not getting a penalty in the lead-up to their second goal, coming back in the game and forcing it at the end. And, you know, and even Arsenal this season, we, should have pr- we shouldn't have lost that game. You know, the- we are... Spurs, Villa, Chelsea, I think they're the main three threats to the top four, 100%. But yeah, so. we um, we are well capable of going toe-to-toe with all of those teams in that top seven, top eight on our day, without a doubt. But over the course of a season, I think what the weekend showed us is that those three teams, I think, are just far superior to everybody else. So those that's what's standing in your way. Whereas the Europa League, I think it's, we've only got, if we don't win that competition, I think we've only got ourselves to blame. Generally, that's how I'm kind of looking. I think it's such a big opportunity for Spurs to go and win that cup. We are the favourites. I think we should be. Do you think our do you think our pro- progress under Ange rests on the Europa League? Um, with the current trajectory we're on, because I mean, love like was saying there definitely is progression there as a team. Yeah. There definitely is an incline, but there's just there's a softness to us that we're going to get penalised. Like, we're going to get... If we keep conceding goals when we're not playing well... It, like, like Palace is a perfect example of... You You set out a certain way. If you're having an off day because of the fragilities or the vulnerabilities we, we, we put ourselves in mm. to blow teams away like West Ham, if we're not performing well, if that if that cohesion isn't there, we get pounced upon. We And, we, and, and that's the risk. Yeah. Can, can you see that us gaining consistency? Do you think our, our our season relies on Europa League? Maybe. Maybe, I don't know. It's going to be a really hard task for Spurs to finish in the top four this season, isn't it? Which is one yeah. up from last year. I think we can do it. I do think we can do it. I think yeah, we can yeah. find that level of consistency. Whether we will or not is a, is a different question, but... Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe it is. Because if we win it, there's no. I think if we win that, then then it's hard, isn't it? Because it's like, I don't know. People, will t- uh, you can. Does a trophy necessarily define progress? No, not necessarily. Because Spurs have progressed massively in the past, but still not won things. Arsenal were on a real trajectory of progression, but still haven't won fuck all. 
you know, since Arteta's bought it, they won the FA Cup. But again, that was a bit, bit yeah, that's a write off, off in it. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. really count if I'm being honest with you. Um, <laughs> um <laughs> it's like if we were to get past City tomorrow, which like I saw you put it in the running order, like why am I confident despite the negativity? I kind of am as well. Like, I kind yeah. of am as well. And if we get yeah. City out of the way, that there's still other big teams in it because of the way they've fucking done the stupid basic seeding of the competition, which is like bollocks. All the big teams are still in it, pretty much. And I don't know if there's any other all prem games. I'm just gonna have a look. Um Brighton, Liverpool, Villa Palace, Man United, Leicester, Newcastle, Chelsea. Oh, of course, the Gooners are the only yeah. fucking team that are playing tomorrow that haven't got a Prem side. Preston away. <laughs> fucking come, come on, Preston. Come on, Preston. Come on, please. Um so I don't know. I don't know, mate, but it's <laughs> I, I, we, we, would you say like if we won the Carabao Cup would you say that's progression the Europa yeah. League is definitely the Europa League 100% is because it's like that. I is... think it's because of the competition I think I think you've got to look at the competition I mean, you, we, we've got the progression there as a team but then you look at the competition in the Premier League and, and it's you're thinking you look at Chelsea fuck look at what Cole Palmer did that in that game you figure yeah. what, on we Sunday? cannot compete yeah, and then you've got Neto, who we missed out of, uh, missed out on. Yeah, they got Neto players on the bench that would that would probably improve our team. And I, and I know they're a laughing stock. They have been a laughing stock, Chelsea. But there's something that's just clicked now. Yeah, and, mate, how good, and I'm stressed. Way, and I'm not. Uh, this isn't me comparing him to Slank. I'm, I'm, I'll defend Slanky so much. I thought he was brilliant. How good is Nicholas Jackson? Yeah, he's actually. It's I've said it. I've well. said it for ages about that guy. Like I just, like he was a bit of a laughing stock last season, but he's he's great. He's a really good yeah. striker. So they've got yeah. it's clicking for them. It also does help. They, I think Cole Palmer is probably the best player in the world right now. Him and Yamal probably. Are the best. Yeah, yeah, it's a joke, isn't it? But then that that proves that that proves that you can go out and sign players for how much did Chelsea sign City for? They signed him for signed him for what 30, 40 mil. You can go out and sign these players that are game changers, that are catalysts in, in certain games when the going gets rough, that can churn out performances for you. So it, it shows that we we can, we are capable of doing what Chelsea did in, in buying Cole Palmer and 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 progressing and and taking that leap above the teams around us by yeah. signing someone as important as as good as Cole Palmer from I mean it's it was just it was I mean it was a good sign at the time but who would have seen that happen happen yeah that, that that's what I was just gonna say that that you can't I don't think anyone could have foreseen the the rise of Palmer in this way you know no but it does it prove Spurs can do that oh absolutely there were there are players that we could have bought Cole Palmer but not that we I'm not saying we definitely should have but I mean, I'd love to. That'd have been fantastic. But, <laughs> I mean, this is a guy they were talking about in fucking going on loan to Burnley. Did you see? Do you remember that last season? They're like, not from Chelsea. Oh my god, Burnley were yeah, yeah, yeah. one of them on loan, didn't he? And then he goes to Chelsea, and it's like, no, this guy's clearly like the one of the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be tough, but yeah, I mean, Europa League is one hundred percent draw a line, like like exclamation mark progression, because it's like, despite the fact that I said that we should be favourites and should be winning it. To go and win a major European trophy like that is, is yeah. remarkable. Like, a remarkable achievement despite the fact that I think we should be favourites. Look, United getting a new manager now. One chucks them into the mix again, back into that race for European places alongside us. I do think Amarim, it looks like it's going to be... I don't think he's necessarily got the profiles in the squad to make such an immediate impact right now. I think it'll make yeah, it better, maybe, yeah. But, you know, he plays yeah. a 3-4-3, he wants the centre-backs that are good on the ball. Have they got that? I think it really suits players like Hoyland. Um, Massively. Like, Look at what Hoyland. he did with Jokeres. Exactly. Hoyland's quality anyway. I do I do think that. Xerxes as well is like a kind of a floating striker behind Hoyland. Rashford, kind of like a... They, I mean, still their left-hand side is so important. They need like a defensive wing-back to play that system. But um, we'll see what happens there. But I think, again, it chucks them back into it. Again, Europe, they're probably now, would you could argue with what Amarim's done at Sporting. Not necessarily on the European stage, but you could argue that they are our... Um, they not to Arsenal actually, didn't they? Not to Arsenal in the Europa League a couple of seasons ago. Yeah, they did. Yeah, Garte hey. was quality, and, and yeah. he's a player he's got his, his disposal now. Yeah, Pedro Goncalves with the uh, lob. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. No, I, I it, it chucks them back into it for Europa conversations as well with us, doesn't it? So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, they've got Chelsea at the weekend, so it'd be very interesting to see how he gets on this first game if he is confirmed by them. But it just shows you the competitive nature of the teams we've got around us in the Prem now. Yeah, so we've got a we've got a question because because that's a nice segue into 
I think the media, if say we lose to City, Villa, yeah, I think the media will start. They'll they'll choose Ange as the next target because they oh, they yeah. let's be honest, they made life for Ten Hag impossible. Every single press conference, and I know he was a he's a, Ten Hag is a proper weirdo, and he, he didn't he didn't do himself any favors. He, he yeah. but it was it was hostile. Not it was a nice really position to be in, in is it? End. Yeah, exactly. No, no, there were so many hit pieces on him and on on. Um, and you, that's kind uh, of why you for, could... for articles and yeah, because I spoke about I don't know whether did I say this when we were recording or did I say this before we were recording about the Ange quotes from today where he was almost. I think we. I don't think we were uh, before. Before. Yeah, basically, yeah, Ange, no, yeah, yeah. Ange got asked about it in the press conference, and he got asked about his job security as well. And he was just like, "Look, I can't control that." Like, he was basically saying about Ten Hag about, and I think he said this before the United game, didn't he? When we played them there, he was like, "Well, you look at this guy. He has one, you know, he's won two trophies since he's been here. Finished third in the first season." He's like, he almost said that like, you guys are going to treat him like that. You know, I know that's coming for me. He sort of almost said that I think before the United mm. game. So I think he's aware mm. of that. And I think he was quite, that's the reason I think, look, we all thought Ten Hag should probably go. We all thought that it was probably a case of him, them sacking him, what are we now, October, five months too late. It probably should have been after the cup final. I think all United fans feel like this season has been a bit of a waste of time. But you can understand from a manager's perspective in terms of what Andrew's saying and what he's been saying today about the fact that at the end of the day, when you break it down and look what he did at United, um, it kind of shows the scru- level of scrutiny on on management now and on managers in terms of how hard the job is because again kind of going back to what we were just saying about Spurs winning a trophy it's not about it's not about Spurs ticking the box of proving everybody wrong and kind of shaking off this Spursy tag if we were to win something this season it then immediately switches to what is the next thing naturally football like moves on like yeah. that. of course it does but then it'd be like okay now so go and, quick go so and win, quick. go and win it again or go and win the FA Cup go and win the Premier League this is why Tottenham have to kick on now and then yeah. it all changes again doesn't it you don't get a moment to sort of sit back and go nah fuck we just won something like we you know you hardly do that really unless you're Man City you do it every fucking year but you, no question <laughs> you ask those kind yeah. of teams you know or Liverpool if Liverpool to win something you, they'd, in a, they'd never have that conversation if Liverpool won the League Cup or the FA Cup which they did last season uh, League Cup sorry the one last season, there's no conversation about like what's the next thing. So I kind of get why Andrew's being quite defensive of Ten Hag, even though it's quite clear that his position was probably untenable because he knows yeah. that's coming for him. He know, of course, he knows. So in terms of what yeah, yeah, of course, we yeah. were just about to talk about about Andrew being the media's next target, of course he will be. Absolutely, yeah, he will be. He, he will, will be. be, and it's going to be. We're going to have yeah. to buckle up and just accept it. The the patronising discourse around Ange every loss, um, which isn't there when we win. And when we blow teams away, it's never there. No, um, it, it, it's it's a little hint, a little insight into if it does get rough. And we, I mean, because like you said, what was it, seven and eight uh, or or seven and nine wins we've we've got? Yet there's still this sort of insecurity around him, and and that is sort of in like bled through the media and and what the media uh, think of him. Yeah, and everything we consume is always it's very contradicting and it, and I, I i mean i think not for us so i think i think for the people that don't consume spurs content and sort of get this sort of whenever we lose there's a catharsis and and, and it's almost like therapy when we win we can get every bit of drop of dopamine we possibly like can get yeah. but for the for the fan that turns up to the to the that still reads the newspapers turns up to the games on on like at, at match days for the fact that everything they're going to consume is going to be hit pieces in the future. I can see this happening. I, I don't think that's sort of, I, I don't think that's unrealistic. I can see there's going to be so many hit pieces on him. He's the next okay. target for, for the media to sort of go for. So I, I, I think this is where we need to be strong as a fan base. And it's never going to be that because Twitter is so contradicting and there's so many, there's so much, um, there's so many different sort of opinions on there. I think we're in a fragile state despite us winning a lot recently. Yeah. Because there's little things that are happening, little signs that we're seeing, fragilities that are quite, they they pop up a lot and it's a bit worrying. And I think there is a bit of anxiety around us at the moment. Um, but my, my question is, is that, actually, we got a question from from Jack Enoch out. Yeah. Who says, he just says, will Ange be our manager next season? <laughs> What, Jack, why can't you just written like a fucking long <laughs> essay question like you usually do? Why do you have to ask like hard hitting questions like that? Can you fuck off, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> you fuck right off. Um, what? Great question. 
It's yeah. a great question, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah. I, because I, I don't know. I don't know. I think so. I, I do think so. I hope he is. Um, yeah. But I mean, you look at that. Like we're kind of. I mean, to be fair to United, they've gone and they've gone and poached a manager out of another side. If that does get confirmed, I don't know whether it has been. It might be by the time this pods out, but yeah. definitely seems like it's going to be Amarim. Because when you were looking at, when I was talking, thinking about it yesterday, when they sacked Ten Hag, I was looking at the list of available managers, and when Tuchel went to England, it was like, well, what the fuck are United going to do? But you know, at the end of the yeah. day, they are still Man United, and they can still go and get a manager out of somewhere if they really want to. I mean, I mean Amarin, Villa poached uh, Unai Emery. Look what's that? That's done. He was a Villa Real. They bought exactly, him mid-season. Exactly. So what do with with the fact that so many projects since Poch have, if 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 Ange, if, if things go tits up and Ange gets sacked, right? With the yeah. trajectory that Spurs are going on, despite the fact that so you could argue exactly the same about Man United, um, since Poch, the trajectory that Spurs have been on with so many failed different projects, would you back Spurs to go and poach someone out somewhere? Like, I don't know, like a, a like an Amarim. I think Spurs could have got Amarim, to be fair. Like, if, if we were in the same situation, yeah. I think we probably could have. But well, he's been twerking for a move for ages, anyways. He was he was flirting yeah. with West Ham, Liverpool, Man United. Liverpool, he's a bit of a slut. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think Amarim we probably could have got. But then now he's off the table. If things go tits up, who who? What do we do? Like, There's not that many fucking managers out there. There's not, not man- available, available managers, managers are not. Employed, but yeah, un- uh, unavailable, like unavailable in terms of like employed, like Amarin. Other than him, I'm, I don't know who I would have backed us to go and get. Yeah, I do think like even if worse comes worse and and Ange goes at some point of the season. Which again, I feel like we're being too negative. I, I do not want this. Yeah, neither I do I. think he'll be in a better place of like better. He'll be better off still for looking for a new job. Adjbozkoglu, like his his sort of status has gone international and and global, and and there will be a lot of teams thinking he'll be really good to sort of like yeah. Because look how he got us playing. If you compared us to how defensive and how brainless we were when we were going forward before, even Conte's gone to Napoli, like. I think there was a there was a, a an anxiety around going near the Spurs job before Postecoglou took it because they were looking at for their future. A lot of the managers we spoke to were thinking about their futures. Yeah. But I don't think it's I don't think it's I don't think we damage a lot of careers. I just think it's a bit of a poison chalice because there's so much scrutiny when we lose and there's so much to do when it comes to sort of when we talk about DNA etc. Do you really? There's no point fucking going for another. That is not the answer. Sacking a manager and getting a new manager in is not the answer. Because how many times are we going to see this and it not work out? We need to give Postacoglu the time. And and at the end of his contract, assess and think, okay, now we can't, we've can't. we given him the proper amount of time. Because let's be honest, he's only had three transfer windows. Yeah. We definitely could have done more in the summer for him to benefit him. I mean, I was talking about Neto a minute ago. I know we went, we actually tried to get Neto and he chose Chelsea, but you're thinking like, imagine if he had him at his disposal, etc. But yeah. you, and, and, and yeah, a lot of managers are in, uh, the managers that are in a job, there's a lot of settled projects out there as well. There's a lot of settled projects. I, f- I feel like there's maybe, is it H- Hoganes for, for Stuttgart, who's people are talking about, there's, there's, I mean, Herzler looks like a good manager, but then you never yeah. know he could be on a good bounce. But that, that's not inspiring. I don't think that. I don't. I won't be like, yeah, that is it. That's what. Yeah, this is the there guy. isn't that at the moment. We need this. Yeah, but just stick with Postecoglou. Stick with him. But saying that, I look at our squad, and I actually think it's quite good. Like, I think I think we should be doing better. And being yeah. more consistent with the players we have, we yeah, had a conversation, a, a question from from Ryan Walton on Twitter. He said the Palace game clearly highlighted that our squad isn't the finished article. If you had to pick an area to strengthen, start an eleven signing, where would it be? And I was looking at, the t- I'm looking at the team. Before I get into that, I'm looking at our defence, considering our defensive fragilities, and I know we've improved in 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 conceding XG, in we've conceded the same amount of goals as Arsenal. But I'm looking at our our defence in, in, individually, a doggy, Poro, Van Aven, Romero, we non-stop talk about how sensational they are, all of them. Yeah. But we are so, we, we play in a way that if, if it doesn't work in, up in the, in the final third, we are so vulnerable at the back. Yeah. And, and I look at our, t- I just look at our team and think, 
we should be doing better now. We, we okay. should be doing better. There's definitely signings. I think we should definitely make, like I said, I've said about game changers. I, I think maybe someone like a, I think maybe a right winger or a versatile forward that can sort of occupy multiple positions. May, yeah, but, yeah, but I, I think maybe an Embuemo or something like that. Someone who's who's ready to take that step and be a really important player for a, for a team in a big six. But uh, we, I, my worry is, and, I, and I'm, I'm with him to the end, but he needs to be doing better with his squad. I think the squad is capable of a lot more than what we do, what we put, what we're sort of doing now at the moment. Yeah, it's just about consistency, isn't it? Because we, we, I think we've seen what this squad. We, we, I mean, we go over this all the time, but like we've seen what this squad can do. We've seen how, the level that this squad can hit, and it's a high level, high level. Like not a good side. We can be, like I said earlier, when we, when we're when we're good, we're great. When we're bad, we're shit. Like, there's no real in between with Spurs. So, that's the key, find that level of consistency. And I think having a level of consistency in terms of results, like you said, comes back from having more game changers and game breakers on the pitch. Someone, more physical profiles as well, who can just grab that's games really, and yeah. be a bit more solid. Um, I think, I think as the season goes on, it's going to be really hard because we spoke about this before, about finding the balance of like, that midfield and why again when this system with the two tens works it really works but when it doesn't sometimes it again kind of like everything I don't think that's been a real cause of our issues this season so far but one player that's come in and always makes us look better when he does play is Pat Matasar and he's that yeah. kind of physical game changer so I do think Saar is a cheat code in this in this squad so does he have to play more I think he plays tomorrow definitely do you try and turn him into sort of a six is he good enough on the ball to do that maybe not under pressure I don't know but then when you look at Benton or yeah. it's like we've got these are good players. Like they are, you know, I don't know. Or make tweaks t- tweaks that can accommodate the the weaknesses in certain players. I mean, we've got such a young team, there's definitely gonna be weaknesses in, in individuals' games. Do yeah. we start making little tweaks to sort of just give them a little bit of leeway where the consequences if they do make a mistake aren't conceding the goals like straight up? Because yeah. that's the way we play. Like, look at Palace. We made a mistake and set a score. They're in, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's every every time. Like, it's it's every I time. Don't... It's not just yeah, yeah. It's I don't know. Apparently, in Buemo, they want Bright Brentford want fifty million pounds for him. I think you can do that. I think I think you can do that. That's a no brainer. I, I was thinking like hundred mil. Look at what they're doing for Tony. Is that a contract? I know he's next summer. Out of contract. With this summer coming up. Yeah, I think so. I do. I say do that in January, mate. Genuinely, yeah, I say I do that in January. I think with, so. if we hold a bit injured for ages, I don't think Yang's going to be the player we need right now. I no. mean, in the future, yeah, but but we can't put that sort of pressure on him. I th- I say we have to do. We have to have a catalyst for games. I mean, you look at what he did for Brentford at the weekend. I know he didn't actually shoot. He crossed it, but he's just causing problems left, right, centre. Such an important player for Brentford. Yeah, fifty mil. I think that's such a no-brainer. We definitely have the funds for that as well. I just think. I, I, I think with Postacoglu, the thing that's going to make him successful is at Spurs. It's also going to be the thing that gets him sacked. There's no in between with Postacoglu. It's yeah. all or nothing. So uh, there's things that we can implement in the way that we play that manage games better. Whether yeah. that's a bit more nastiness, whether that's time wasting. Uh, Matt Seppler s- s- spoke about why our waveform is is, is is what it is. And yeah. I think this is what we can in- integrate into home games as well. I mean, yeah, the constant think- need to get on with the game as quick as possible. That, that's something that's got to change, I think. Stop that. Yeah, slow the stop game that. Down. Understand the game. Yeah, understand the game. Slow it down. Gain control. I mean, Matt Sappler, uh says, "Do you, what do you think the, co- the, the root cause for our waveform issues I've absolutely fucking butchered that. Small pitches. What do you think is the root cause? Yeah, how big is Galatasaray's pitch? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, is it mentality, leadership, or just squad? Uh, ju- just a squad that's missing key pieces. Um, I just had a stroke reading that. Sorry, <laughs> um, but the I I, I I genuinely think there's so many things we can implement. It, being a more of a rough team, and I, I always say this: I fucking hate watching Arsenal play because they're such dickheads on the pitch. Yeah. Raya will go down. I know how Webb spoke about maybe implementing some stuff for the referees to sort of understand that when a goalkeeper goes down, you can't then bring the players around and have a tactical sort of discussion. Yeah. But the but the the I, I look at Arsenal and I think they're dickheads, but it, it takes so much pressure off them. It kills all momentum against them. Yeah. And that's when Arsenal were are sitting back and defending. 
I mean, if we can start doing that and then hit him, hit him hard. Yeah. It, we it will never let opposition grow in confidence. No, exactly. Um, because and I think be, we need that, that. Yeah, there's that possibility. You know how devastating that team can be. That's the thing. Yeah. Same yeah. as Arsenal, of course, obviously. But I was thinking this earlier, like, and it kind of just picked up on what you just said there about being nasty cunts, really. Like, can you imagine if we had the blended? I hated him by the end, but I still do, you know, like him now. But could you imagine if we, <laughs> if Postacoglu and Mourinho kind of merged into one manager? And it was like we had the style of play of Postacoglu and that design is to play attacking front foot football. And maybe him, his handling of the media side of things, don't really, really let Mourinho speak. But that behind closed doors <laughs> is like, we need to be cunts. Like, yeah. that's what I want. I don't, this yeah. first team is too soft because we, we want to, it's really hard, the, the juxtaposition and the kind of trying to work out the balance of it. Because like, when we play well, we are so good. And I love the way that we play. And I hated the way that we played under previous managers for the most part under Mourinho and certainly in the second season under Conte. But that game management is something that needs to change. That's that's a big thing. Recognition yeah, of game management. Just like, please stop trying to play out from the back all of the time when you are clearly under pressure and you can't get past their second phase of their press. Go long, hit your striker, play off him. These kind of things. Makes you, makes you have more strings to your bow, makes you more unpredictable. It's just does my head in all the time because every team in the Premier League to some extent will put pressure on you teams press way more than others look we thought Brentford were going to come here a few mm -hmm. weeks ago and not press us at all sit back they didn't and that's actually what they're kind of undoing was when they pressed us we pressed them it, it worked and we won that game and we were a much better team but again they still had chances I can accept that teams are going to have chances against us Man City give up big chances high XG chances look at Fulham at the Etihad a few yeah, weeks yeah, do, yeah. Um, it, it happens it does happen but it's just that that recognition of game state needs to it has to it has to change blood. <laughs> it has to change blood. He has to change. He has to change. <laughs> I, I I do get what you say. I mean, Man City, the best team with the ball, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I know data will probably show that maybe. And again, we are, game change like Man in terms City, of attacking wise, the players that can literally just well, so we have that moment. Yeah, get, not, not they've anywhere got that, near but... the same level, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, even then, I mean, they've they've gone out and signed their, their recruitment is kind of what we're trying to do. They'll sign players for like forty mil, and and they turn and I know it's Pep Guardiola, but they they are game changers. Like Savino, I know they had ownership, like some sort of ownership over him, but he's coming and he he looks like he's going to be. You can see the progression already. You can see the potential, and he's going to explode. He already has sort of, but wow. He's really good, and he uh, he's really good. But, but I mean, you were saying the thing about tomorrow. Like this is also the thing about tomorrow. About like Pep's like, yeah, we're gonna fucking change the whole team. Basically, probably means that he will play. <laughs> Do you know, like I know he actually yeah yeah the weekend, playing the like, kids. He's you still kind of in there, beat it or like Doku, and it's like oh fucking hell, oh, oh fucking hell, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh fucking hell, oh, yeah. Fucking uh, hell. But then what you were saying about Man City is that. Man's, Man City will lure teams into a false sense of security by going long sometimes. Like, I know Vicario probably can't do what Edison can do. But Brentford, but, well, he can't. That's how they scored against but, Brentford. But, but yeah, just long ball, Haaland, they catch Brentford out completely. Brentford all commit, Haaland's for on goal, bang, goal. Easy as that, because they think, okay, they're going to play. When we play our first long ball from a goal kick of the season, it's going to catch someone off guard. Yeah, people are like, <laughs> they're gonna be like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> I thought they couldn't do this. <laughs> but you saw, but you saw. I don't know what the to do. I and the evidence is there to show you against um, Crystal Palace and against West Ham. In the last two games, we've come up against three centre backs in um, Palace. And uh, by the way, how good is Lacroix? Yeah, he's good. Isn't he? He's, he's good. good. Yeah. Uh, like we've actually one of them, didn't he? For, he did. Yeah. Summer. You could under, I mean, yeah, that, if that's your if there's anyone that's as close to Van der Ven in terms of like that profile, it's him, isn't it? The pace is a joke, yeah, possibly, yeah. Um, but you've come up against a back three of three physical center halves in Gahey, Chalabar, and Lacroix. And look how look how well Solanke could battle against them and draw them out. And like, again, we sp keep speaking about that chance that we had with yeah. Kulusevsky drawing center backs on to win, winning those duels. West Ham, Tadebo, physical centre half wants to get touched tight. I'll roll you every fucking time. You know, you've got there's evidence there to show you that if you try and hit Solanke, he will be able to bring the ball down. You'll be able to play. It's, it's not as if you're lumping it up to Richie that's going to be like, oh, by the way, like going back to the like absolute balloon touch. Yeah, that, exactly. And look, <laughs> I, I've, I've flip flop. I, I love Richie, but. And I was pleased from the other night, but stay out of fucking Ballon d'Or conversations, mate. Oh, no, like, I know. I the Instagram live and shit like that last night about the Vinicius Junior. I was like, mate, you got game on Wednesday. You know, it's time to go to bed. 
And when he was saying, did you also say that, <laughs> did you also say that apparently he's 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 elected to not put himself forward for any uh, French Football Association or Ballon d'Or awards in the future? It's like I'm just going to tell him. I think you'll be all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you'll be all right there, mate. Yeah. What is a polar bear doing in Arlington, Texas? Um, so yeah, he's pissed me off. I don't really want to see him play on Wednesday. I don't know. Please. Really. Yeah, I'd rather play Solanke. I think Solanke. I think Solanke. I don't. I don't really want to start Solanke three games in eight days with Aston Villa on Wednesday, Sunday. I think Solanke's got to play for me tomorrow. Physical, like they He's got to play. God. Solanke and Kulusevski, I think, still have to play because it's like we've yeah. shown City have shown vulnerabilities on transition when teams get physical and have runners, like with Wolves last weekend. Uh, Traore, I mean Traore is a freak, but Traore uh, a couple of weekends ago against Fulham. I think Solanke and Kulu for me and Johnson. Have, have to play blood and Johnson, yeah. They have right. to play blood. Yeah, um, I think so. I agree, mate. I agree with with Saar and with I mean we're gonna get onto it, but with maybe like uh, Benton Corpusuma. I think I think that's the way you have to go that strong and then see what the game's saying. But I just think we need more physicality. I mean, we got we got absolutely kicked out of the game on, on Sunday. We yeah. were like whimpering, like oh, and it was getting us frustrated, and we were like, Why can't we play? Why like just fucking get on with it and Give give it back, but then there's a fine line, and I think we're scarred from the Chelsea game where we lost four one with our first loss of the season last year because I think we were over sort of stimulated, and Romero got sent off, and then a doggy gets sent off, and I think we're then thinking, okay, now learn from this. I think we can use that as a write off because that Romero one was a bit debatable, anyways, and the doggy was the second yellow card. We need to fucking kick teams and and and. Uh, suffocate them from every single aspect on the pitch not letting any growth from them in momentum at all and we don't do that and it's going to be a, we're going to be the architects of our own downfall here because we're too soft and every hard bit of hard work going forward we 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 produce it gets undone at the other side of the pitch yeah and that's why games and why we're so inconsistent games can swing both ways so easily um and it, and it's so frustrating as fans because it just gives us anxiety. We have anxiety. We have no idea how Spurs are going to like, affect our mood. Yeah. Every weekend, we Did just you... have to like go with it and roll yeah. with punches. Really. I've just seen base. when you're talking about those physical profiles we've got on the ball. Apparently, Ange Postecoglou is a big admirer of uh, Carlos Belaba at Brighton, according to Talksport. Really. He he pro he does sort of profile similar to Bazuma, though, doesn't he? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I think we need more of a... Okay, let's talk about Johnny Cardoso, yeah? Yeah. Because there was a bit... Uh, he's had a good start to the season, apparently. I'm not going to pretend like I fucking watch every Real Betis game and that, but he's... When you watch his highlight reel against... Against... Bet, um, it was Betis and Atletico. Atletico, oh, Atletico, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, which, are, are ve again, most physical side you're going to play against. Most battling midfield you're going to play against. Johnny Cardoso absolutely dominated and you look at him he's built like Rodri I'm not gonna I, I, he, there's always gonna be comparisons to Rodri I saw this guy on Twitter saying Man City this is your Rodri um replacement whilst he's injured there's always gonna be comparisons because he's 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 clever he's a he's a he's a out and he's a six but he's that sort of like destroyer six yeah. but he's he's good on the ball he's a good passer yeah um he's not gonna be Basuma Bentoncourt gonna wriggle out of out of tight spaces yeah but He's a he's a he's a presence and a and a, and a he's a personnel on yeah. the pitch that we significantly lack. What what do you think? Do you think that because I think Paul O'Keefe was surprised and he was thinking we've just used this in a in a negotiation because we think he's got potential and people are going to buy him. But do you think now we need to actually go out and get him because I think we can get him for like twenty five mil. Yeah, fast track in January. <laughs> Be nice. Yeah, should we negotiate? I mean, I, I, I think we'll end up at Spurs. I think I think we need him. Yeah, I think I, th I think especially if he continues to perform like this, the fact that Spurs have got first refusal basically that's kind of that is what it is, right? Yes, but then if someone bids like fifty mil, I think we can match that because it's either that or we just get half of that, so twenty five mil. So I think it's like it's quite clever, I think, because we could if say he's he's got a fifty mil price tag or whatever it is, we can either lose a player that we never even had and get twenty five mil, or yeah. we can spend twenty five mil on him if no one wants it. I think I'm pretty sure it's something like yeah, that. Then or, or match it if they do want to. Yeah. 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 I think just go and get him. I think he's a, from what yeah, I've seen, yeah. I think he's kind of a bit of a floor raiser in that midfield. He's some a profile that we don't really have. He looks composed on the ball. For, I'm going to do a video on him on my channel because I didn't yeah. do it at the time when we signed him. 
But I think now is a good time with the performances that he's putting in, especially that performance against Atletico at the weekend. He was a monster yeah. when you watch him break up the play. Yeah. Um, and also, like, when he does get into the final third, he has got composure on the ball. I think it's more just maybe you'd probably back Basuma, certainly Basuma over him in terms of receiving the ball off the goalkeeper and the centre-back. Yeah. He's, he's a bit more maybe rigid maybe than Basuma. But then again, how old is how old is Cardozo? He's like 22 and he's... 22. Like There's no yeah. reason why you can't turn him into more of a possess-resistant midfielder as well because all of the other game parts of his games are quite set, you know? in terms of that ability to break up play. He's quite Rodri- Rodri-like when he's on the ball as well. He is, yeah, he is, yeah. Play. And maybe, do you know what the perception of him would be so different if he wasn't American as well? Because imagine if he was Spanish. I think people, <laughs> yeah. would just, I think people yeah. are kind of put into the back of their minds. Brazilian, he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. So I think people are kind of put him into the back of their minds because he's, <laughs> cause he's, uh, cause he's <laughs> American. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I think it's one... If you want to go, go and try and do it in January quickly while people are like, okay, yeah, well, maybe we're not going to spend 50 million on him in Jan. Go and go and go and get the guy. Oh, he yeah, looks good, yeah. really good. Yeah, he's already accepted the Spurs move. So he's yeah, that, he's that. I mean, why can't we just adjust in a way and play him in a double pivot? I feel like if you have a someone in a, his profile, players are Archie Gray when he comes into like midfield. Absolutely going to thrive in a in a double pivot like that where he has a little bit more. Um, yeah, to go and Saar as well. Saar because that's Saar, a, that's Benton, the big thing core, with, I think. Yeah, that's the big thing. I think we've said about Saar this whole time about like. Why, the reason he's perfect for a four-two-three-one or a more of a double pivot formation yeah, is yeah, because yeah. Hey, you do, again a bit like Cardozo. Would you would you would you back him in terms of as that sole number six, as that sole pivot of getting the ball off the goalkeeper and the centre backs and trying to play and get out of tight spaces? Maybe not. But again, we spoke about it last week with like players like Kulusevski and all those other other players. It's not a weakness. It's just not you know not as much of a strength. Well, I've said it before, and I, I know there's a lot, a lot of expectation on him when he comes in in the summer, and he's not going to be ready. I mean, you look at like Bergvall, how he's performed, and he he's going to have a lot of a time to get adjusted to the to the physicality, the pace of the Premier League. But yeah. Luka Vuskovic, his agility and his and his 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 ability on the ball, and his I mean his his ball progression, everything in his arsenal. I think is perfect to mould him into a number six like that, that sort of destroy a number six. Because I, I, there was a lot of sort of complaints, not complaints, but worries about his pace. People watching him for, um, is it Westerloo? Westerloo, oh, yeah. Oh, Westerloo, yeah. Westerloo. Westerloo. Um, Westerloo Superman. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, I feel, I feel like he's, he's actually not that suited for an Ange high line if he's, if he's going to be, uh, not, maybe on the ball, but if he's going to be, if his pace isn't his biggest asset, number six, he just, I feel like he's going to absolutely explode if he's if he's started if he's if they start playing him number six. I don't know. He just looks like an absolute monster that maybe could cover in in, in centre back as well. I don't know. Yeah, what do you think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I was just looking at Cardozo as well, but that option can only be exercised next summer. I was just looking it up. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is basically what you just said. Um, just getting there quick. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, I, Vuskovic is an interesting one as well because it's a bit like, it's different with, you know, with Dragosin, I'm kind of starting to have doubts about why we signed a centre-back of that profile when he's got those limitations on the ball. But I think with Vuskovic, where he's like 17, you know, he's nowhere near. You can mold him. Yeah, you can mould him, exactly. You can get a little, like, little play though and just kind of be like, man, you, we are going to make you good in the ball. And he's, yeah. play, he's, he's got agile good. He's agile as well. He's, he's agile. agile. For someone that's like six... You know how like Van der Ven, uh, Tim, what did Tim Sherwood say when he was like, it looks a bit wooden at the start? And it was like, I think there's a risk of like tall centre backs like that looking a little bit wooden. Um, but no, he, he is quite agile. Uh, monster yeah. in the air as well. Absolute monster, mate. You, you do think of like, if we start bringing these players in, our, our physicality in the air and our worries from set pieces, they're going to evaporate completely. I know, yeah. we, I know we've been a lot better, but we've, we are signing that sort of profile, those sort of profiles. And it, yeah. That's got better for us as well. Yeah. Um, but moving on to Man City then. Yeah. Um, who do you think will play then? We've, we spoke, so you said you, you want to see Solanke, uh, uh, Johnson, Kulisevsky, Saar. Uh, but there's a... I think there's a bit of anxiety creeping in now that Oda Bear's out for a while. Son's not fully fit. That Werner's yeah. going to start on the left wing. Um, yeah. Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah, I think so. I think Werner plays, isn't he? Um, I, again, it's hard with Mikey because it's like, do you play? You start him in three games in eight days? Maybe not. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, I and just kind of hinted at making changes, but you and it, it's so hard because you have to manage this team. But you know, where he brought Madison and Kulusevski off on sixty minutes on Sunday, there's no excuse yeah. as to why they maybe probably shouldn't be in the team. We've got after Wednesday, we've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday to recover for Villa, you know, and then go again. Um, I don't know. I, I think it probably will be Werner. Um, I think he just definitely deserves another chance because I think the team's performance didn't give him the platform to thrive and show everyone what he can do, but... Who might keep more? Yeah, but I think it will be Werner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to go into like Mikey Moore too much because I, I think it, it, if you're going to go into his performance, I think it's harsh. It's his debut and he was a microcosm for... And also, he wasn't team. bad, he like wasn't the, bad uh, either. No. On the ball, I thought he was pretty tidy. Yeah, no. He didn't look out of yeah, his no, on yeah, the ball. Yeah, no, yeah. Physically. Th- th- and there wasn't any squad cohesion at all with anyone so it was hard to sort of settle into a game and and he and i felt bad for him i did feel bad for him for, for that to be your debut and we spoke about it countless amount of times when you start integrating youth players into a team you need the environment to be healthy for them to sort of sort yeah. of take it take to it like a duck to water and growing confidence like uh az Alkmaar, az Alkmaar. that was it perfect for him to sort of thrive in then you bring him into a game where they've we've been set up to fail not set up to fail but like with Palace waterlogging the pitch sort of going to try and kill everything we have before like, as from minute one and we we as a team don't grow into the game at all how are you expecting a 17 year old lad on the on the wing to sort of grow into a game I, I, yeah, exactly. I don't want to go into his performance because I think uh, nothing worried me about Mikey Moore at all because the whole team were, like was struggling so um, uh, yeah but you think it's too much for him to start you think Werner's going to start on the left wing yeah probably but again, if he's, yeah. yeah, maybe I wouldn't. I'd probably be more happy if it was more than Werner. But I think the sensible thing to do is probably play Werner. But I don't. I don't really want. Yeah, it. yeah. one of them. Nah. One of them. Do you think like maybe Dragerson comes in? What a left wing. <laughs> <laughs> and fucking, yeah. this is it, mate. The turn. And he starts playing fucking dragons in left. Some league. people have been. He's probably the best about, job. Yeah, some people have been suggesting about playing Madison out wide, um, as a wide. Crew. I don't think that's the worst idea. Because didn't not the worst am I going idea. mad or did? Well, no, he didn't play there. But remember last season against City at home in the, that the brilliant game where they won the league. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did we sort of play with really floating fluid front four? four. Madison was go, playing out left quite a lot, wasn't he? Son was out there. Uh, he was then floating into the middle, yeah. and again, you he, think... he, he was free roaming, wasn't he? He definitely was. So was Sar. He, like... he, had, he had the license. Maybe that's what we do. I don't know. I think, I think with, I wouldn't mind seeing Madison play out there because when you think about what our left winger's job is, a lot of the time, it is about the. That's why Madison, I think, is so good for the role that he's actually playing now. Because, again, like I said, I actually thought Madison had a decent game on Sunday. I thought he was probably. I, I was. I was amazed when he took him off. Um, yeah. That chance that we had in the first half that comes from that combination play of we see it so much with Spurs. It's like we see, we're seeing a lot of it on uh, on some uh, fucking Thursday and against West Ham last weekend as well, where the left winger will just stay that little bit deeper and wider. Left back makes a run to the byline. A dog. I'm talking about the Basuma goal, for example, against West Ham. Chance we yeah. created on Sunday. Yeah. That little combination play down the left, which involves the ten, the winger, and the left back. I think is that we often see that a lot more. Yeah, our right hand side dynamic is very different because it's just about getting Johnson in behind a lot of the time. That's what we want to do, um, and that's why it's better having your creators on the left hand side because it attracts more players, attracts more bodies. Therefore, you can switch the play and get Johnson into the space. That we saw that a lot against Altmar. Yeah, where we just didn't find Johnson quick enough. I thought a lot of the time Johnson was often like, "Get hello." It's like, you know, we we yeah. and Johnson just couldn't get in the game on Sunday. I have to be fair, but. Um, might be one of them where we play Madison, maybe we play Johnson again, play Madison at left wing, have Kulu on the left-hand side of a midfield three and a doggy. Oh, fuck knows. I don't know, mate. I do, I'm trying to think oh, about this later if I want to do a preview. So I don't know what, yeah, we, yeah, know what yeah. we do. Like, you maybe Gray right back is like, how I think far so. you maybe change the the, the, the defensive uh, back line. Oh, yeah, like, Spence is apparently there, back. Uh, Spence is apparently back as well. Oh, is it, you mentioned there about how we how we sort of shaped up against City last time we played him in that game. I don't know why we haven't started doing. We haven't tried that again this season. It was 
re- it worked really well. And then you're looking at Solanke, how he can sort of play. And I mean, Kulisevsky could be that that false nine, and you could look at Son. Or obviously, he's not going to play, but Johnson and Solanke could do that. The front two sort of drifting yeah. out wide, looping up. I don't know why we haven't really implemented that in in certain games yet at all because it worked. And, and another day, if 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 the context of the game around the game was different. If the fans get behind the team a bit more, we would have. I feel like we would have blown City away that game, that day, and 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 it yeah. was a really good tactical tweak that was refreshing. I know we lost, but it was refreshing. We played unbelievable, and, and it was different, and it took teams by uh, took teams by surprise when we played it again against. Um, was it who did we play after that? Was it Brentford? Or, Sheffield, United. Think, or, uh, Sheffield, Sheffield United. United, but was there another game as well? Maybe. Uh, what so. was it when Van der Ven stepped in left back and he scored that goal? Oh, Burnley. Um, Burnley, yeah. That was, before, that was like before, that, maybe, before we... Man City. No, that was before. Oh, before, yeah. That was before, yeah. But I, I, I don't understand why we're not trying. Anyway, um, but I, I don't think we should change too much against City with our team. I, I don't think I've, we need to go strong. We need to get this sort of, like we said about Europa League with the little dopamine hits midweek that completely change your perspective on, on Spurs before we head into the weekend. We need to go strong. And if we can beat Man City, not Man City out of the Carabao Cup, all of a sudden we're going into Villa, back at the boys and come up. Like, do you know what I mean? The whole momentum ch- shifts, the whole perception ch- uh, shifts. Um, and uh, it's so, I think uh, this, this is why it's so important. We cannot go into Villa and we go one, two, nil down and it starts getting hostile. We can't do that this yeah. early in the season. They, they, it's frustrating that these games are so important already but then you're looking at us if we want to win trophies we've got to play these games we've got to beat these teams so Man City we've got to beat it and, and like I say I'm weirdly confident because Spurs mm. are just like this aren't they? Just yeah fucking, this is what Anne, just, this is what Anne's just done a team like this yeah this is what Anne said he said we'll do similarly to what we've done in all our midweek games Europe included which is try to pick a team we think will win the game and take into account we did play on Sunday so will be changes but Oh, I don't think too many changes. We cannot come in because I, I feel like he can't. Teams he can't play, make nine changes like he didn't against. No, he can't do that. No, we'll get penalised. We can kind of get away with doing it against teams like AZ Outmar, but oh yeah, this but, but, yeah, one three out of three, like, and we'll get absolutely dick. But yeah, then again, yeah, yeah. It's like maybe it's a case of you know, like how we play, how we lined up against. Is it Ferenc Far or so? Like I think Van der Ven will probably play. Yeah, I, I think he has will to probably play Vicario. I think will play in goal. Um, Dragerson and Van der Ven, if they play Haaland, I think is a good centre back. Parents play. Haaland. It won't be Haaland because you've got. Did you not think it won't? It, well, no? I fucking hope not. Well, we'll Who put, else have they got? Pep, how many front? times? Have... Great question. Fuck. <laughs> well, Pep's kind of Pep kept saying, didn't he? He was like, "I'm." I, I, he was like, "You have my word that we will not basically take this competition seriously." I can't find the That's actual true. point. They've won it so many times, they don't fucking even care. I know. But then maybe Gundogan will have that another, like Davinson Sanchez getting sniped in the air. There's Gundogan just... He's been shit this season, and... only Gundogan. He's yeah, he has, yeah, but what if he plays in false nine? Yeah, let's have a look. try and find what he actually said. But um, if, we'll see. When anyway. you, whilst you try and find that, um, I've got a pet question, because we were saying about Archie Gray starting right back. Um, Billy Price says, um, early in the season, it was heavily rumoured that the coaching staff had been blown away by Archie Gray. Yeah. He has not started a league game this season. Has his lack of game time in the Prem just uh, like been justified? What uh, do you make of that? I think, I think, I mean, where he's, what, 18 years old, I think. Uh, I don't think there's too many complaints. I mean, he's up against Pedro Porro. He's yeah. up against... Uh, who's a myth? Benton Corbis, Swimmer Madison. I think his time will come. I think, yeah, I think people are getting way... Berg league is where we bleed him and into the team. I think people are overreacting way too much about that. Those Bergvall and Gray comments from the Sun. People keep, I keep seeing people bringing them back up again. Bergvall has started every Europa League game. Gray has started every Europa League game. Just because they haven't been starting games in the Premier, even though they have been coming off the bench at times. Yeah. This is what it is. They have been... You, two things can be true. We probably should have signed maybe another midfielder, potentially. But then it's like you look at the competition we have actually got. It's, we've got a lot of midfielders. So one of them maybe would have had to have moved on. But also, yeah. they both can be ready for first-team football just because they're not playing. That doesn't mean they're not ready. Same thing we've had about with Moore and Arsenal fans have had with Winery. They're getting frustrated about his lack of appearances. It happens with young players. You have to be careful, man. Um, I, it's a long I, season as well. Really yeah, long season. Yeah. Uh, he said, I oh know, Haaland will not play apparently. He said, "I'm going to oh, think." Yeah, he said, "I'm going to think against Spurs. Maybe some players from the academy, 
We will see tomorrow. A Haaland rest. He looks tired. I think he needs it. No midweek game increases his hold and captaincy appeal. But oh, never mind. That was a fucking someone tweeted that about FPL. <laughs> that wasn't a quote. Oh, <laughs> the academy bit was though. I thought he was going about his captaincy appeal versus Bournemouth. Well, <laughs> sorry, what? Uh, but Pep, Pep put him in his FPL team. Yeah. What? What? Um. What would you do if they just went full strength? I'd. I don't know. <laughs> There is also an article in the Independent that is like the reason Pep Guardiola may have to break his Carabao Cup promise. It seems that in each of Man City's last two games, their manager has only put five outfield players on the bench. If a shortage is explained by injuries, there are six absentees more than the usual at the Etihad. Few of those, some clubs, of those six, Jeremy Doku, Jack Grealish should not be sidelined for long. Kevin De Bruyne has already been out for longer than City expected. Walker always looks. Oscar Bob's obviously injured. Um, yeah. If. So I've got like James McAtee and places players like that. I'm trying to see what other injuries they've actually got. Yeah. They've actually got quite a few injuries. See, yeah, Grealish, Doku, De Bruyne, Walker, Bob, and Rodri are obviously all out. That's you know they are big. That's a lot of big players. But how, how important? How important do you think the Carabao Cup is to us this season? I think right now it's very important. I think this we need we need we need comp competitions to really pull us through this season going off the start we've had in the Premier League, I think. Yeah, this, ga- this um, game in isolation is very important, I think. I think so. I think it's massive. And I think that's why I, I think we should make certain changes, but not. I think we need to keep our, our key players on the pitch. I think, yeah, Vicario, Dragusin, Van Aven, Doggy, Gray, uh, Basuma, Saar, Kulusevski, maybe even Mad- Madison Kulusevski in midfield. And then I'd say Solanke, Johnson, and Werner. I think I think we've got to go as strong as we possibly can, but make a couple of tweaks. Yeah, agree, agree, mate. I totally agree. Yeah. Well, we'll see um, how we're feeling after the Man City game. Um, ben, I'll see you at the City game, mate. Yep, exciting times. Let's get um, everyone up Spurs. Up Spurs. Thank you so much for listening. Um, share the podcast with with friends you think will like it. Um, don't forget to like the video, comment. We love every comment that comes in. It's amazing. Like it, it's incredible um, how many people get involved. And um, yeah, subscribe if you haven't already. Everyone, yep. up the Spurs. Up the Spurs. I'm quietly confident for, for City. Yeah, we're going to smash them. Quiz, quiz, quiz. Yeah. <laughs> nice one.